Well, welcome everyone to our uh, reading in the Cosmopolis of Memory, Women on Cultural Selfhood in a Globalized World. And I'm really excited today to welcome to the panel um, my fellow writers, uh, uh, Shadab Hashmi, uh, Samina Najmi, Zaina Beck, and Dima Shahabi. Thank you so much, everybody, and thank you for welcoming me into your group. Uh, we're going to, as we move through, I'll introduce each person and then they will read. First, we will start with Shadab Hashmi, um, who is the author of Ghazal Cosmopolitan, Comb, Coal and Chalk, and Baker of Tarifa. She is the winner of the San Diego Book Award and the Nazim Hikmet Poetry Prize. Her work has been published worldwide and has been translated into Spanish, Turkish, and Urdu. She has an MFA from Warren Wilson. Thank you, Shadab. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. It's so good to be with you all. I'm going to uh, begin with a little statement that describes the topic a little bit. How does one make a compelling work of literature in a world where identity is manufactured by mainstream culture and is subject to perceptions based on political grounds? As a writer who has inherited the English language as a contrary gift from colonial Britain, I have found myself in a linguistic territory that is at once provocative and inspiring. Provocative because not only the language, but the literary tradition is a landmine of violence against or of silencing the other. Inspiring because it offers interrogative, investigative possibilities, as well as space for reinvention in post-colonial times. Global languages today are the colonial languages of the recent past. Globalization necessitates the fostering of power principles. It's a common language built around economic incentives. It commodifies culture, promoting fads, sameness, reductive thinking, stereotypes. It privileges the voices closest to the power base. There is, however, one factor that counteracts the conditions that steer literature away from complexity and nuance. And that factor is the technology that enables global connectivity. Connecting online with writers and readers across the world in the past decade or so has been invigorating for me, especially because much of my work is an exploration of historical and aesthetic overlaps between diverse cultures such as the Abrahamic Convivencia in Spain, the syncretic nature of Urdu and the Ghazal form, and the artistic legacy of the Silk Road. To write as an American Muslim woman of South Asian heritage has been hard. I have repeatedly asked the following questions. How is a conversation to start without a common cultural language? A context. How is connotation possible without context? How is poetry possible without connotation? I answer these questions by trying to build that context in my work. So in the selections that I'm reading today, there are some new poems as well as a prose passage from my new hybrid memoir, Comb, which is centered on my childhood in Peshawar, a Pakistani city along the border of Afghanistan during the time of the Soviet war. And after the prose piece, I'm going to read some poems. So um, this passage is from an essay called Rope of Hair. Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair so that I may climb the golden stair. The witch sings to the blonde Rapunzel imprisoned in her tower. In a legend, Rudabe, the dark haired princess of Kabul, lets her hair down like a rope for Prince Zal to climb up to her tower. She has eyes, quote, like the narcissus and lashes that draw their blackness from the raven's wing, end quote. Her name, Ruda Bey, means child of the river. Rapunzel is Brothers Grimm's 19th century retelling of Personet, which is surmised to be an adaptation of the millennia old Persian legend of Ruda Bey, recast in Shahnameh, the Persian masterpiece written by the poet Ferdowsi in the 11th century. 
Ferdowsi's lofty praise in his poem set a high bar for the artists who painted the legendary beauty of Rudabe. Quote, about her silvern shoulders, two musky black tresses curl, encircling them with their ends as though they were links in a chain, end quote. As a child, the links between stories from the East and the West emerged first through startling common etymologies in everyday language, songs, and stories, then through reading about the history of the Silk Road. I, re I read fairy tales in English from the left to the right side and stories of the Alif Lela, 1001 Nights in Urdu from the right to the left. Access to the lexical spectrum of the Indo-Aryan as well as Abrahamic civilizations is the beginning of a lifelong curiosity about the ancient trade routes named the Silk Road. Peshawar itself being an outpost and Kissa Khani Bazaar or market of the storytellers, it's relic. It will be many years until I'll actually visit the area many of the stories conjure, Central Asia, as a grown up and a writer. E pari o fairy. In Tianshan mountains of the legendary snow leopard, errant wisps of mist float with the speed of scurrying ghosts, there is a climber's cemetery. Himalayan griffin vultures and golden eagles are often sighted, though my attention is completely arrested by a blue whistling thrush alighting on a rock. Its plumage, its slender, seemingly weightless frame, and its long drawn ventriloquist song remind me of the fairies of Alif Lela that were turned to birds by demons inhabiting barren mountains. The word fairy in English may have been derived from the ancient Zoroastrian Persian Pari, the first mythic creature I remember from lore and lullabies and the television show Alif Lela in Urdu. And um, I, I've picked poems with similar themes. So this first one's called Woman Looks Down, Jinn Looks Up. And Jinn, as you know, is a supernatural creature from the Islamic tradition. This unspeakable inversion, smoke trembling down the roof garden, curling in its monkey tail a hunger for history, that sponge of hidden laws, more digging for gin, more kneading for woman, ancient bread, a weathered palm, open to hawks, stargazers, and swallows. Jinn lands on woman's palm. A jinn has climbed the vine of henna to settle atop the wheel on my palm. King of all lost things. Gold teeth, family trees, wrapped in embroidered silk, verses folded into walnut crevices, names of women who have leapt into the yawn of demons, have slain with fruit knives, women who have sewn shut war wounds, who have cracked history in two. And I'm going to read uh, three poems, three love poems. Um, and this first one has an Urdu word, motichur laddu, which is a bridal confectionery, and motichur literally, mean, literally means shattered pearls. Love poems compass dusted with chickpea flour as if it were the aromatic ash of a celestial tree, powder of solemn oats and scintillation of starlight, even between locked horns. Henaid, she looks at how the cities written on her palm are shaped to shelter his heart, how the sugar syrup binds semolina, cardamom and saffron, the flame high, melange of motichur sculpted into a globe of shattered pearls his hand a sea, her eye star. Love poem resisting the neon larvae of headlines. The world a baby tied to dynamite, a butterfly perforated with poison arrows, burdened with deception and bones. We rise as emissaries to God, our bodies blue with reason, three quarters of the time. The rest, inked with florets, 
tiny tendrils of bread with minuscule kisses of Turkish honey, we start by wiping down the constellation. Then our hungers, we write ourselves anew in God's bulletin. And this is the last one. Love poem carried by the hoopoe. Its shadow curling, crossing Milky Ways, lunar cuts, craters, ice and oceans of dust. For us shorebirds with no fine crest or velvet flight, just the formula of love in veins, exact ratios between each other's wingtips, trills, intuiting light and fractions and winds directions. We fly low and long, turn for joys folded with aches in proportion, turn seasons from burnt nests to gold leaf pages, our, our poem in mythic talons above. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shadab. That was beautiful. Um, next, we have Samina Najmi, who is a professor of English at um, California State University, Fresno. Um, she writes essays centered on her life in Pakistan, the UK, and the US. She has just completed a book-length memoir of her home in Karachi. Her work has appeared in World Literature Today, Massachusetts Review, Entropy, The Rumpus, The Progressive, etc. Welcome, Samina. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Thank you um, to all my fellow writers here and anyone who is watching um, right now. Um, I, I, I just want to begin with um, a little bit about my relationship to language. Um, for many Muslims, the first rite of passage focuses on literacy. It's called the Bismillah, which itself is Arabic for beginning in the name of Allah. My Bismillah was observed when I was three years old in Karachi. I gather I read the first three letters of the Arabic alphabet, same script as Urdu, to much rejoicing and feasting afterward. And yet, I don't think of either Urdu or Arabic as my first language of literacy. While Urdu was all I spoke in my early years, once enrolled in primary school in England, English was the first language I read and wrote in. And then I majored in English too, and fell in love with the suppleness of the tongue. Shadab has already spoken so eloquently to the complexity of our post-colonial inheritance of English. Eventually, we make these impositions, linguistic, religious, cultural, our own. But much remains untranslatable for me, and I have learned to accept that fact as a wellspring of my creativity. So I'm going to read um, two uh, pieces here. Um, the first is titled Memoir in Dust. Nostalgia is Karachi dust gleaming on the shelves of Mr. Book, watching from the balcony as lives converge in Kamran Market, the Muslims call to prayer, a periodic refrain to other imperatives, live chickens to sell from wire cages and mangoes ambering on a wheeled cart. Human cookies crumble in our mouths as we walk staidly to the Kodak studio for a family portrait. Nostalgia is filmy songs blaring from the barber's radio, guts on the ground, the stench of slaughter, feathers scattered at our feet. Chak is our word for earth, for the dust that we are. Chaki, the adjective. Who knew this one element we share wouldn't translate? Khaki caricatures all the earthiness out of the body and its, and its vestments. We have more poetry in us than that. Dust Bowl has echoes of ruin and nothingness, of land laid bare by fate and folly. Lives rendered unlivable where they, where they had been rooted. Migration, the reset button, the toil, the journey, a new patch of earth, alien and inviting from which to sprout a future. 
You just take care of the dusting, he says. I'll mow the lawn. Just? Dusting is delicate, diligent work. Approach each piece with reverence. Pick it up, caress its contours, and place it back exactly where it asks to be, a little shinier for your touch. How is that not heavy lifting? Dustbin, an anomaly in my present life on this continent. It makes my children laugh to hear me use the term. It annoys me to hear them laugh in the face of my urgency to take the trash out before we miss the weekly pickup. Dustbin stays, reverberates through the decades. Memento of a tongue I acquired in a land that wasn't mine and couldn't keep me. It holds the things I never asked for, never wanted, and the dust of everything dear. Let me get up then, dust myself off, move on. From love, from motherhood, from home as I have known it for 20 years. It was dust I cultivated, dust I planted, dust that blossomed and bore fruit. Let it linger a while longer on me. I don't know how to breathe without it. And, and, um, this one um, is titled Ash Tree Elegy. Calamity is a fire that obliterates everything but itself. Explodes you out of accustomed ways of being, your accustomed ways of seeing. Home will be home again someday, but how to go back when I go back? To the cocoon of a condo on Calamurna Ave named for the valley fig with roots in ancient Smyrna. Transplanted to Fresno, open voweled Spanish for this land of ash trees. A Calamurna condo my children loved, a nest post-marriage for my birdlings and me. Restoration companies bid for the assignment. They talk of structural damage and loss of use personal property divided between the salvageable and unsalvageable. They'll rebuild the drywall and replace the very frame of the roof. Trust in technology to abate the asbestos, ozone the smoke odor out of all that can be saved. Even my long awaited, long traveled couch and carpet, off white in color because why not now that the kids are grown up and gone, those belongings will be good as new, they say, someday. I'm grateful, I believe. But who will restore the cindered self? Compile an inventory of the ways I used to be. Insurance companies speak of policy limits. I never thought, to, I, I never gave thought to limits on anything. It was quite the conflagration covered by local news. Fire trucks lining the street like a long metallic red hot ribbon. Come gather and gawk. Behold the blaze, the sublime of the spectacle, the spark of a story, and in its wake a heart. Charred its capacity, lavished with abandon, a self-indulgence as though at some all-you-can-give buffet. No thought of depletion, the finiteness of things. Finally, a reckoning. A baptism of fire. My world, a blistering cliché. With apocalypse comes revelation. The busy, the awkward, the indifferent. The scorching scarcity of grace. Let me know if you need anything when calamity strikes. When fire burns a hole through the life you knew, what you need is warmth. There's no explaining irony to the oblivious. Like a crazed pyromaniac, I watch my bridges burning. From Calamarina's ashen attic, 
no phoenix rises, just a bleak light dawning through the haze. Now in my one little flame of life, an eternity to re-see, of learning to re-be. And the sadness settles in like smoke, opaque and thick and cloying. Thank you. Thank you, Samina. Really powerful. Um, next up, we have Zaina Hashem Beck, um, who is a Lebanese poet. Her third full-length collection, titled O, is forthcoming from Penguin Books in the summer of 2022. Her poems have appeared in the New York Times, Poetry, Plowshares, and The Adroit, among others. Go ahead, Zaina. Hi. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, reading with you today. What you need is warmth, is, is beautiful. Thank you, Samina. Um, all right, so I will be reading from O, oh, the forthcoming co collection. And uh, since we're all talking about language, I'll be reading uh, what I, a form that I call a duet. Uh, the duets are bilingual poems. Uh, so when you're looking uh, at the poem on the page, you see the English, uh, you see the Arabic on the right side and the English on the left side, and sometimes they uh, mingle in the middle. Um, the idea is if you only know English, you've got a poem in English in front of you. If you know only know Arabic, you've got a poem in Arabic in front of you. And if, like me, you jump languages, then you just kind of read it zigzagging through and hopefully a third poem opens uh, in the space that is the conversation between these two languages. And I don't know what drove me <clears throat> to write the duets, but I know that I've had a relationship of guilt with Arabic for the longest time because it is my first language and I did learn it quite well in school and then somehow I majored in English and found myself more comfortable writing poetry specifically in English. So I think the duet started when I was slowly starting to return to Arabic in terms of reading it. And I found myself uh, just, the, the, the lines were coming out in Arabic. And I was too much of a coward to just write in Arabic. So I thought, okay, let's, let's do both. And then this, like, this is how it developed. Uh, and I'm now, going back to writing fully in Arabic as well. That's that's an experiment. But so I guess this is all linked to what we are talking about, living between languages and our relationships uh, emotionally with these languages. So this is a duet that I wrote as an ode to the Mediterranean Sea, specifically in Beirut. And it is called Blue Azraq. نرى البحر ولا نراه إلا في المنام A patch, a glimpse among the antennas أو من بين الشرطان على الأسطح How to brave this blue لا بحر لنا هنا ولا قوة Sometimes I forget the sea is this close لنا حب قديم يريد أن يحفر لك في الإسمنت شاطئا My love, I want to dig a beach for you out of this cement لنا مطر محمل تارة بعطش الأرض وتارة بعفن الشارع O oh, old faith and new O oh, time of wells and time of satellite dishes. لنا الحر والرقص على ظهور المباني قد نرى بقعة بحر من هناك. Are the fish still edible? Our nets are full of plastic and trash. لنا كأس تجري فينا كنبع صغير ننسج فيه سماء وغروبا ونجوما وتراتيلا. My parents threw me in the sea when I was two, 
and I floated. They called me little fish. My parents trusted the sea. إلهنا الأزرق لم نعد نعبده وما زلنا نحبه Oh, blue God, we no longer worship, but still love. لما لا نتذكر البحر إلا عندما تموت العصافير على الشرفات? Over breakfast, I had to convince a friend Beirut was still on the Mediterranean. لما ندون أحلامنا كل صباح? Are you sure? He asked. Is it a deep, bluest blue? ما أجمل الموت بلا ضرائح. Yes, I said. No, I said. ارفعني على كتفيك قبل أن نحرق المدينة. Lift me on your shoulders. Roll in the tires. Light them up. Oh, city, we no longer love, but still worship. لقد أقسمنا أن نقلع عن عبادة هذه المدينة. So this is uh, blue. All right. So the the next one is uh, something I wrote a, a few days ago uh, as I was packing. So I'm I'm now I'm preparing to move, uh, as you know, uh, to uh, from Dubai to California. And this is the first time I'll be living outside the Arab world. I grew up in Lebanon. I've been here in Dubai for 10, 10 years. And I guess part of me is kind of grieving, uh, on some level, the loss of Lebanon and the collapse of it, and also moving west completely. So this is also for Beirut, and it's called Emptiness. I am told the city is becoming friendless. No one can keep up with the departures. The city is no longer the city, not even its shell, its shadow, its desperate hope. I keep seeing mountains where there are none. I realize the same thing over and over and over again, though nothing surprises me. I pack my bags. Where am I going? Oh, I suck air out of plastic to fit embroidered shears into... Why am I going again? Oh, the house is full of empty frames. I've taken out all the photographs. I was supposed to return and instead I fly for the fourth time so far. My loved ones and I no longer share the same day. I strangle the suitcase with my weight to close it. There I bled and the sound of laughter soothed me. I asked for lighters and fell drunk on the sand until my friends placed black coffee under my nose. I left before we started rehearsing for the play. When people speak to me of the future, I don't think they mean this. Once the kids are grown, once I've lived in all the elsewheres, I will come back and the city will be empty and it will be too late and not even I will be there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zaina. Wow. Ah. All right. Well, um, I'm going next, and I'll read my own bio. Um, I've received a couple of UNESCO cultural heritage grants for work supporting women writers in Azerbaijan, where I taught for a year. Um, I'm a poet, a scholar, and a translator, and I teach also at California State University, Fresno. My uh, creative and scholarly work has appeared in um, a variety of US and international journals and books, and I 
have been translated into Azerbaijani. <laughs> My claim to fame there. Um, so as a child, I lived in Istanbul during two key periods of my life when I was learning to speak as a baby for my first year and when I was learning to read and write in first and second grade. I ate there, slept there, went to school, played with my younger siblings, played with my neighbors, um, and uh, my life was immersed in Turkish. I was a native English speaker. My parents um, really, were native English speakers and spoke English mostly at home, but I started out my life nearly bilingual. Later as a teenager, my family lived in Yemen for two years um, and I learned a little Arabic, which my father speaks fluently as well as Turkish. It was a beautiful welcoming Yemen. My father is a white Euro was a white European American and professor of Middle Eastern history and he largely grew up in Saudi Arabia and Lebanon. Um, to the end of his life, he felt most at home in what people call the Arab world. He was fluent in Arabic and Turkish. He prayed with his friends in Arabic, although I don't know that he was a believer. And he was buried in an all-Muslim cemetery. My mother was never bilingual, but she liked being everywhere and loved all the differences in the world and was most happy when she was in other places. <laughs> um, the pain of war and the after effects of colonialism, which in my father's childhood was inextricably tied to, um, played out in long time throughout my life. Um, many of the places we had lived in and spent time, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and so very heartbreakingly Yemen, was often a, a kind of undercurrent in our family life, a kind of sore, especially in my father's later life. Um, later, when I lived and taught in Baku, Azerbaijan as an adult, I relearned um, the Azerbaijani form of Turkish and began working with local writers, mostly women, and translating. And it was in translation that I reconnected and kind of found a piece of my language and literacy identity that had been kind of submerged. And I, I feel like in transla translation almost feels like my language in a way. Um, I'm not actually going to read any translations today. I decided to just stick with reading some of the stuff around my own identity. So my first poem that I'm going to read is uh, Dil Eti, um, which means tongue or tongue meat. And um, in Turkish, in Azerbaijani Turkish, which draws, uh, is it like English because of colonialism, because of the, the back and forth over territory, it, it holds many words for things. So heart, there's like, uh, I don't know, it feels like a dozen words for heart that are drawn from Arabic, from Persian, from Russian, from, um, from uh, you know, Turkic languages. Um, so dil in, Tur in Azerbaijani Turkish means tongue, and it also means language, but of course it also means heart, which my friends here uh, who speak Urdu know that word as actually. But literally in, Tur in, in Azerbaijani, when you say dil, it means your tongue, you know, it's, it's, so it's a great, lang a great word. Dil eti. I don't have to go into butcher shops this time. See the meat? See the meat the way it is honestly in pieces that remind you of your own parts. Don't have to smell it this time. The way meat smells. The way we must smell inside, turned out to air, like this sheep and that half a cow. Or the tripe in sheets and mashed brain the chef used on TV yesterday to cook in another language. I'm just beginning to understand again. His words left tracks in me, channels, divisions a good butcher's eye can see, the live animal already in pieces, skinned. There, the empty space between rib and shoulder joint, flank and hip. I know people eat the brains of animals everywhere, creature language broken into fats and proteins, other useful molecules. At six, I changed my name, bought meat for my mother, walked to school in a black smock and white collar, another nation braided from my hairs and tongue, fingers tracing the parts of words, a soft G for the throat of a city, the wet neck of Thanksgiving, Oazicha. Now I'm a vegetarian, but maybe the trick of it is in the meat. This fatty tripe, a fried wrapper for word spaces eyed in me 40 years ago in an Istanbul butcher's shop hooked, all red and white, hanging. 
And the next one is Kosh Ali Kosh, which is Run Ali Run, which was the first line in the first grade reader in Turkish that every kid throughout the entire country of Turkey read for their very first thing that they learned to read was Kosh Ali Kosh. Um, where English could not, Turkish slipped the six-year knot of her throat, and soon she could recite quite national, red words pressed into a sickle sky, capsized. Each black pocket held a handkerchief. Strange tasting tea was served to every child. Afternoon, she tipped the plastel pastel, the plastic pastel counting sticks, the cardboard sentence strips onto her wooden desk, metal bolted to the floor, white collar buttoned up her neck. She carried and she borrowed, she copied and she copied, and once she got hit with the ruler on her open hand, she did not remember why, it was another land. Once was enough to make her one of them, she did not cry. Uh, teenage years uh, living in Sana'a in uh, Yemen, we um, lived right next to the old uh, presidential palace, which God knows if it's even there anymore. Um, and I could, when I was hanging out laundry on the roof, watch the soldiers washing at their little water area uh, right next to the wall, uh, which was uh, quite entertaining for a teenage girl. Um, Sana'a, girl and soldiers in the spring. Once we shared a compound wall beyond which young conscripted soldiers fed from the worst tooth broken bread, washed at troughs before their prayers for peace be with you, God. Each noon, they lifted white skirts carefully to splash the tenderest underparts before me. Fifteen, hanging wet clothes on a hot wind, in a hot wind, on a roof of mud, above the black Mercedes cornered in that presidential yard, the windshield bulleted and dusty. And I, like Alice, Alice in Wonderland, so drugged and nearly drowned with life, just leaned to look, floated the sheets, forgot altogether the violence of modesty, the scars. Um, Syria is one of those terrible um, things of the last decade uh, for anyone who's, who knows it well. Um, and this is called, this is after a photo I saw um, of a bombing, uh, photojournalism Syria. At first you think the trees are people bent and running then people resolve into trees who cannot run, bending. Bombs lift the dirt from the ground, from roots, strafed, unsafe. No one considers the topsoil. Who runs? Who stays, remains? What did the teacher tell you anyway? What to do with the remainder after rough division? Things don't come out even. The split pomegranate, ragged edged. What does the industry call them, arrows? the seeds wrapped in red, like peace by any other name, please, because peace, like seed, has become arid, unlucky, unloved, unlikely, the part caught in our teeth, shrapnel in the crotch of a tree that couldn't run, that bends and bends. And the last, I don't know if I'm good on time, um, the last is called History Gazal, and it's for my father. Um, it's not the one that I read in our practice, but it's uh, another one that's shorter. History Gazal. I wanted to write first a Gazal, your life being closer to a Gazal. This is the form of Persians, Turkish Khans. From, the, from Oud and Saz singers comes the Gazal. You are a musical man after all, for all your deafness, you'd like a Gazal. It's a form I imagine you'd offer students to give them culture, a gazal. A poetry, a poetry more about love than war is anyway about loss, the gazal. A form that balances on the edge of going on, not going on, this gazal. Syllables, the human story of falling into love in war, a moonlit gazal. In the face of a beloved father, history, lines, repeat, read a gazal. And when a story you can only watch makes itself, ah, alie, write a gazal. Thank you. Uh, now I have to find uh, my introductions. Alrighty. Um, 
So uh, our last wonderful reader is Adima uh, Shahabi. Um, she is the author of 13 Departures from the Moon and co-editor with Beau, uh, Beau Soleil, I'm bad with French, of Al Mutanabi Street Starts Here, for which she received the NCBR Recognition Award. She is also the co-author with Marilyn Hacker of Diaspora Renga. She won the Nazim Hikmet uh, his Hikmet Poetry Prize in 2018. Um, welcome, Dima. Thank you so much, Alison. <clears throat> and thank you so much to my fellow panelists. It's really a delight to be here. I'm sorry about my voice. I'm just recovering from a voice, so please, uh, from a cold. So please bear with me um, as I read in a little bit of a raspy voice. I was really quite taken by the reading. So thank you all. All my fellow panelists spoke of the way English language both enriches and yet fails to convey the full experience of our post-colonial inheritance. Um, ultimately, I do still believe that we are as a whole in translation. Um, the way we present ourselves is a sort of translation to the other here. I'd like to begin um, <clears throat> with a love poem which intersects the landscapes of Palestine and California at these kind of uneven longitudes. It's called Tracery of Dune and Chamomile, and it's after the poet uh, Marie Howe. Number one, it was only when your eyes finally closed against a weeping cherry, lashing your face in the spent season, lashing roses spent in fugue with a long drought, the soil beneath sunflogged and showing its white, wormy marrow, like it was the beginning again when we wrote each other supplicant sentences. But there was no beginning, as when you held a mirror to my face, saying, this is what language is, a smoke crumpling on the light, your voice beyond argument insisting on joining the emphatic dead, when I realized how dream-led I am, my face not yet broken by butterflies. Two, defiled by roses, a garden lifting towards the Jura Mountains and drinking white butterflies with a half-red face. Greenhouses with damascene roses brushing the distance, but there is no perfume in the air when in rows of successive summers, the woodpecker maims two poplars in ritualistic primal. And in the dream, we patch those scars with sawdust, filling until even our nails pierce yellow and our eyes float grit. Is this innocence lost, I ask, as you swear your allegiance to poplars over woodpeckers? Three, smoke in my nostrils from the colder fire, when flames sprout in the hills above Jerusalem, unearthing Palestinian terraces, swelling like topographic maps of our could have been childhood. But there was no childhood that wasn't an allegory. As when I stood outside watering the garden grapevines, all the while feeding my eyes to the ashes and wondering about this colossal of origins, when I finally understood your silence as hope your non-belonging to me as hunger. <clears throat> um, here's another love poem. So I'll be reading a lot of love poems. It's just kind of the mood I'm in these days um, that inter also intersects exiled spaces of youth and adulthood and turns them into a sort of myth reveal as well. And this one's called Lingua Franca, Lingua Franca. <clears throat> The city was a tightrope of eyes as we sat on a bench beneath a row of birch trees. Before your confession, a flock of pigeons flew towards the lake, moss colored in the light. How to say the confessional outlives a boat named Geneva Moon, a season of lemons and our love for a lost country. Years later, we're hiking in a valley chiming with golden poppies in early spring. Out of the blue, a rain cloud gathers over a hill in the distance. And as we begin sprinting back, I recall a moment years back when I placed my lips over your rain mouth. 
how to say your answer drew a Palestine sunbird from my throat. At home, later in the evening, I flag all the objects withering from your half appetite. Decaying peaches and green bowls, drawings of heritage oaks given way to parking lots, brownish bougainvillea and planters. How to say your long ago confession unpulsed a bird inside me. You feign surprise as we step into our garden where ropes of wisteria hang at eye level. Define avoidance, you said half jokingly. I turn away, my eyelashes threshing the air. <clears throat> so in the, um, um, I think Alison read Ghazal and I'm going to read one called Wasted Life. It collects the voices of both powerful and quotidian women in history. The opening couplet begins with a song from world-renowned Egyptian singer Um Kulthum. Ghazal, Wasted Life. One hush, one stage, she floats at odds with wasted life singing, what I saw before my eyes saw you was wasted life. What do dandelion, basil, and oleander mitigate his pain or her fingertips on the gauze of wasted life? First of the rescue rains her wet eyes. Damp lashes excavate dreams but hide no scars for wasted life. A russon, my love, doesn't lean into the slightest breeze. It welds its roots through river pleats with no pause for wasted life. Anbara scrambles to find her love in a labyrinth of gallows. She sees him in a lagoon of skin and bones, claws of wasted life. A long drive to the airport, dawn light the color of iron. Goodbye, father. Distance is always a carcass from wasted life. Don't weep like a woman for what you couldn't defend as a man, she says, as Bawabdil withdraws to wasted life. A light not touched by fire is nothing but a thirst for belonging and your stubble sting against my mouth's applause for wasted life. Thank you. That was that was beautiful, Demon. Thank you. So, um, just to to quickly wrap up, wrap up through all of all of these, it was I was feeling like um, when when you when there's a lot of movement in your life, when you're displaced, when you have to leave places, when you get displaced by by war, fire, violence, politics, uh, economics, etc. Um, for, I, I think for all of us, language, it, uh, a place becomes much more urgent in a sense, and that we use our languages to create place for ourselves, to create a kind of home in language. And if I think like what I, what would be the last thing I would want taken away from me, of course, would be my languages, right? I mean, it's the, it's the place where we are ourselves and where we make our little, our nest, as Samina was talking about the nest. Um, and I wondered if any of you, we have a few minutes, I think, if any of you had something you'd like to add or say about um, of any of it, as, as we think about bringing this all together. Anybody? This might be a little cliche if there are Arabs listening, but as, as you were speaking about language and home, my, my mind immediately went to the word bait which in Arabic both means, you know, a house, a home, but also a line of poetry. So I just wanted to, to kind of say that, yeah, we, we, do, we do that through poetry. It's really a cliche thing. It, it, it looks fancy in English, but it's very, very cliche in Arabic. But, but I still thought it. <laughs> I think it's a very powerful metaphor. And of course, you know, it's the same in Urdu and Persian as well. Bat is, is a verse, but it's powerful also because it's, we, we approach it as poets. That's why it appears cliche to us. But uh, if you think about poetry as primal song, 
And if you think about um, poetry as the earliest lullabies and the earliest words that uh, a, a young child hears, then it's really like your home. That's your language is your home. Your first home is language. It's a voice. Your first home is a voice. And I think that's really what we've been talking about, the voice um, as uh, a voice that can express the deepest of losses and, and fears, and uh, including the loss of home and uh, fears of the future, future home that as Zana was talking about and Samina, you and, um, and also Dima, uh, the, um, that's, that's one. Um, and the other is, you know, what, what I'm very interested in is the voice of the imagination and how that sustains us. Um, the, uh, again, like the, going back to the idea of the primal and the, you know, and childhood. And uh, those are voices that I feel like apart from the, you know, from conventional language, those, that's the, the language that we really can, um, it, it's a kind of a universal language that's also a global language. So it is one aspect of globalization, which is even, even Disney uh, gives us, which is, <laughs> which is the ultimate in globalized, commodified imagination. Even that gives us a common language, I think. I wanted to, to ask Dima, maybe you want to elaborate a little bit, but I really love the idea of you saying, I think you said something along the lines of, it's all translation, it's all, right? So I don't know if you wanna talk a little bit about that. I, I love that idea. I mean, I think that um, as of late, I mean, all our conversations are about that. It's especially what should also just kind of reverberating to what Shavab spoke about earlier how we're constantly perceived in a Western environment, it feels like a massive translation, right? So, um, and so that how, so in the realm of imagination, I think we're truly our authentic selves. And that's where we are most um, truthful, I feel like that's where we're most innocent. But then as we translate that imagination into words in English, I think we lose a little bit of, um, of that innocence. If, if I may say so, although it's kind of provocative to say. Um, so I think that's where I'm, I'm beginning to feel that the, the, the reception, the reception point is, is problematic. And how do we over, I mean, this is the struggle, right? Should that be, we've been talking about these for so long. Um, so that's how do we actually weave the threads between, in that gap, between mm. the innocence and that perception. Mm. And I also wonder whether all poetry, I mean, you, obviously you're talking in an American context, right? And uh, in, in, in the context of we, whoever that we is, someone writing in a language that's that others them on a certain level. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also wonder whether like all poetry is also essentially translation. We're trying to say something, to tap into that, to, to, to translate that world of the imagination and whether there's always a certain amount of failure anyways. Well, of course, when, when, when it becomes a colonial language, it's, 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 more, it's a more of a complex matter. But I feel that even if I was an Arab writing in Arabic, speaking to Arab people, it would still be a, tra it's, it's a different kind of translation. It's a different kind of feeling. But maybe to, to to some in some level, it's it's still translation. I don't know if that makes sense. I think it makes sense. And you know, in the couple of minutes that we have left, you know, I, I and I love everything that um, you were all saying. And, and when we're talking about loss of language, um, you know, I, I was thinking about how we're hardwired as well. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be our first language that becomes our salvation. And this is where I, I love telling my students the story of Alison's father. So I'm gonna hand it back to you, Alison, um, because you didn't share it here, although you did at our rehearsal. Uh, what, 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 Samina? <laughs> oh, 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 sorry. You know, um, uh, after his, his stroke, 
Uh, the oh, okay. Yes, my father, um, you know, our, our brains hold language in all different places, right? And mm -hmm. after my father had a, had a stroke, um, it, his first language that came back to him fluently was Arabic. Um, he had much more trouble in English. And it was, uh, you know, probably just a function of where the stroke was impacting his brain. But, um, but it was just interesting. I mean, it was just something that, that those things, I think, I think one of the amazing things about having access to multiple languages, I mean, and we know this from, from research about actually Alzheimer's and dementia, is that it, gives, it, it actually makes you more resilient linguistically and, and able to function in the world, is that you have the more languages that you have, the more resiliency and redundancy you have built in. And I think, although there is always, yeah, there's always loss in language. There's always in a sort of, uh, you know, not to get too deconstructive about it, but there's always a certain loss in, in language. But there is also creation. Um, and um, in Azerbaijani, uh, the word for creation also has the same root as the word for wound, to create. Um, and I, I come back to that, that sort of the opening, which is a wound, but is also a creation, a new place, a new space that you're opening up. And then I also think that for me, the friction, I, I absolutely believe that the friction between languages that I experienced all my life um, was itself incredibly creative and productive. And of course, I'm coming from more of a position of privilege and um, choices that my family made in moving compared to what other people have experienced. Um, but nevertheless, I, I, it's beautiful. So anyway, we are one minute away. Does anyone else want to? If not, thank you all so much. It was lovely. Thank you. You are wonderful organizing and receiving the idea, Shabab. Lovely to read with you. Thank you so much.